Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. Today Donna will discuss why a data model is an important part of your data strategy. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, click the chat icon in the top right corner of the screen to activate that feature. And for questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Lessons Data Modeling. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session, additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for our new modeling series, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience in data management, metadata management, and enterprise architecture. She is currently Managing Director of Global Data Strategy, an international data management consulting company. Her background is multifaceted across consulting products product development, product management, brand strategy, marketing, and business leadership. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in, in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly with at industry conferences. And she just released a learning plan course on metadata management uh, with us on Dataversity, so we'll get more information to you on that. And today, Donna is joined by a guest speaker, Nigel Turner. Nigel is principal consultant uh, in EMEA at Global Data Strategy. He specializes in information strategy, data governance, data quality, and master data management. With more than 20 years of experience in the information management industry, Nigel started his career working to improve data quality data governance, and CRM within British Telecommunications, and has since used his experience to help over 150 other organizations do the same. And with that, let me turn it over to Donna to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Always a pleasure to work with Dataversity, and I'm really excited about this new data modeling series. So um, I think uh, Shannon already gave a great introduction. Um, but if some of you may know me already, I, are, I see some familiar names on the slides. Um, and if you're in data modeling, you may have known me from a couple places. Um, I worked for many years uh, doing product develop, uh, product management at um, your studio um, and did their, their process modeling tool and their data modeling tool as well. I uh, was in the OMG doing some of the BPMN standards there. Um, I also spent many years at Irwin, so many of you who are Irwin folks might have known there. I've probably been with most of the data modeling tools out there. I also had a stint with um, the CA and, and Platinum Technologies Metadata Repository. So as Shannon mentioned, uh, metadata is near and dear to my heart. So also co-authored two books you might be familiar with, uh, with Steve Hoberman, another great data modeling expert. Uh, one is Data Modeling for the Business, uh, which is a great kind of overview. It'll, it actually fits a lot of what we're talking about today on basically why a data model has business um, alignment and, and how you can help it with the business side and, and not so much on the technical side. Um, if you are looking more for kind of a how-to on data modeling, I've also co-authored a book again with Steve Hoberman um, on data modeling made simple. It is specifically with C.A. Irwin, or formerly C.A. Irwin, um, but it's a good how-to on just data modeling in general. So um, I am on Twitter, so at Donna Burbank, um, and there's also a hashtag for this, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, Shannon, Lessons Data Modeling, right? Lessons Data Modeling without the N in it. Um, Shannon mentioned that Karen Lopez had previously done this. I am not as good at Karen for, for tweeting um, at six different places and doing a marathon and cooking eggs at the same time, but I am pretty good at trying to monitor. So if you do have a question or a comment during the presentation, either give a shout out to me at Donna Burbank or use the ha and or use the hashtag lessons in data modeling. I am joined today by my partner in crime, Nigel Turner, um, who is a uh, partner at my company, uh, Global Data Strategy. We do a lot of strategies. If you didn't get that by the name, that's, that's the topic of this presentation. And he's worked with me on several projects doing data modeling and data definition and data quality for some of the efforts we'll talk about. So I thought it made sense for him to join today. And Nigel, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Donna. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on when and where you're listening to this webinar. And I think Shannon introduced me far better than I can introduce myself. I suppose the only other thing I'd add there is, like Donna, I'm very active in the Data Management Association, and I'm currently Vice Chair of Dharma in the UK. But unlike Donna, uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not based in the US, but in the UK. 
And if you follow the news, I'm sure you'll be aware that the UK has been pretty quiet in recent weeks. We've just had uh, the, the resignation of uh, a Prime Minister. We've left the European Union. And the opposition Labour Party is at civil war. So it's pretty good today to focus on the relative certainties of data modelling and data management. And it all seems so calm and, uh, and sanguine compared to uh, what we're putting up with in the outside world. So what I'll do now is calmly hand back to Donna, who will put today's webinar in the wider context. Donna. All right. Thanks, Nigel. Um, and Shannon mentioned uh, the data modeling series. I just want to give a quick um, discussion on the, the lineup there. Um, and, and just give a shout out, many of you might be familiar with the data modeling series that Karen Lopez ran for many years, and I've been a guest speaker on that um, and probably listened to a lot as well. I'm a big Karen Lopez fan. Uh, Karen Lopez has moved on, and I'm taking over the, her, her what do you call it, professional reins. <laughs> um, and so this is the lineup for this year. Um, and um, we're always looking for new topics. So at the end, you'll see if there's something on here that you're just dying to hear about data modeling, you know, either we can cover in a, a future series and or blogs and or there's a lot of content. Shannon always tells me that data modeling is one of the most popular topics at Dataversity. So happy to give you more if you're looking for it. Uh, so this month is why data model is part of your data strategy. Uh, Shannon and I went back and forth on topics. The beauty of data modeling, and I'll talk more about that in the session, is that it does so much that we're going to talk today a lot about the business side of it and how it can really do that comprehensive from the business down to the technology. Um, and so picking topics, we're trying to do a mix. So in some cases, it makes sense to get very granular. You know, how can we do data modeling for XML or JSON, some of these emerging technologies? Maybe more broader, how do we do data modeling with metadata management? Um, so you'll see that from month to month, we try to break it up. Some get down in the weeds, some get high level, and we just wanted to make sure we cover something for everybody because data modeling is so broad. Um, for time to time, like I'm doing today, we'll have guest speakers um, on the UML. I'll give a call out because I think they're both on the call, uh, Norman Doust and Michael Blaha, um, two excellent data modelers, especially when it comes to UML, will be joining me for the September one. So please join as many as you can um, and stay tuned because I think there's some good topics coming up. Uh, next, month, next month is uh, big data, which should be fun. So what we'll cover today, uh, what a data strategy is, we get a lot of questions about that. I think probably second or, or up there with data modeling in terms of popular topics is data strategy, which I am pleased to see. I think it's a good, and we, as I mentioned at our firm, we do a lot of that of companies are saying, how can I start with the overall picture before I start any particular implementation? And that's a great thing. Um, we'll talk about how you can use a data modeling for that top-down business requirements as well as the bottom-up technical landscape. And then, importantly, how data modeling fits with a lot of these other data management disciplines. Um, so without further ado, we'll jump in, if I can move my slide. Um, so this is sort of our framework for a data strategy. So everyone has their own definition of a data strategy. This is ours. I think it really depends on what you're doing in an organization. Um, so I'm a big fan of starting with these top-down business priorities, right? So I think any company, before you start anything with data, it's, it should be obvious, but why are we doing this? What is our business strategy? Are we trying to get into a new market? Are we realizing that data is our asset in the organization and we need to manage it better? Do we want to optimize our business processes through data? Data, one of the reasons I'm still in it is that it is so exciting right now with things like big data, with IoT, with all these new technologies, and I think business people more and more are getting that and are seeing data as a valuable asset, I think where it breaks down, um, I think a lot of business people have an idea of, these are some neat things I've heard about with strategy. Um, they get a little confused towards the bottom of how do we actually implement it, and that's where IT can, can fit. So having IT and the business work together is a huge asset when it comes to a strategy. Where a data model fits in, and we'll, talk, uh, we'll go through each of these layers in the presentation and relate that to both data modeling and data strategy. I'm a big fan when I do a data strategy to start always start with why are we doing this. Again, that seems so obvious, but it's amazing sometimes people do, hey, I want to do a big data project. Why? Well, because I read about big data and it sounds neat. You know, that's probably an extreme, but unfortunately sometimes it is not. Um, the, other where, the other side is that bottom up. So what do we have today? And as, as you know, with data modeling, that's a great um, thing a, a data model can do of what is my inventory? Do I have you know, SQL Server and Oracle and some DB2 database that Joe wrote 30 years ago and no one has any idea what's in there? Um, so how do we get that inventory of not only the legacy systems but some of these new big data systems or unstructured data? How do we give that some structure in a data model? And then where data models apply is all these layers we'll go through. So again, if we're going to in integrate the data, you definitely need those data structures and the metadata around it. Is, if you haven't got that I'm a big metadata fan, you will by the end. Um, and that's one of the beauties of data modeling is that that metadata, both technical and business, can be stored. 
So why are we doing this integration and data asset planning is the stuff in the middle that gets a little more interesting. To me, this is where um, the business and, and technology start to mix. When you're doing things like master data management or data warehousing or BI, that's where you're trying to get that valuable um, nuggets around information. What, what, how do we get a single view of customer? How do we see trends in our customer buying patterns? You know, that's kind of the fun stuff. And then do we have the quality around it and the modeling to make that happen? Um, data governance, Nigel's um, been doing this for many years, and then he'll probably talk about this later in the presentation. Um, and a data model is a huge asset in data governance to actually make this actionable. But as you know, governance is a lot about the people and the process and the culture um, and, and building a data model to help enforce that. So we'll kind of go back to this at the end. This is our framework that I like because it really starts from everything from what are we trying to do as a business to what is our existing technical landscape, and then how do you manage and massage and make interesting all the stuff in the middle. Uh, I'll just talk about this quickly, but I'm, I'm passionate about it, so I need to cover it. But again, one of the reasons I'm still in data is I think you know, my, my first degree in, in university was economics, and I started out as an economist, which I'm, I'm now finding is a data scientist, right? <laughs> um, because we did a lot of statistical analysis. Um, but part of that was going through data and doing software analysis around data, so I jumped ship and, and went to the data side. Um, but I still have that business side of me that you know I, I, I enjoy that, and I think in data now, that ability to meld the two is, is even bigger than ever. So I, I find two ways you can really, companies are looking to transform their business using data, and this is exciting in the business. I, I see there's many ways, but kind of two camps to that. One is more optimization. How do we become a data-driven company? How do we do, build better marketing campaigns by understanding our customer, getting a 360 view, getting competitive information, et cetera? How do we build better products by understanding patterns? You know, better customer support. We look through support logs and link that with um, you know, customer data, et cetera, et cetera. That's taking what you do and doing it a lot better through data, which is exciting, and a lot of companies are, are getting that. I think what's even more exciting is this transformative nature, and I've worked for several organizations across different industries that say, you know, the signs on the wall that I wish I, I were there to have come up with that, but they came up with it before they asked me in, <laughs> is that we're becoming a data company. And I, I think what a lot of people are realizing, whether it's from, you know, energy companies with IoT to telco with, with you know, all of the cell phone log data and, and usage data, footfall analytics, to um, insurance with all the data they collect on their customers. Can we monetize some of that? Is data now the product? You know, think of Google, data is their product, right? Um, and so I think more and more companies are realizing that data itself is a valuable asset. So maybe how do we do something different that we hadn't before or augment our existing business model? You know, think of telco, a lot of what they're selling is, is data. Um, you know, in a way, telco, the network is a bit of a commodity now. A lot of people can do that. You want to optimize the network, you know, here, in terms of the optimization, but how can we use that data to do something different? So that's where I think if we get the data strategy right, um, IT can have a seat at the table and, and business can do some interesting things. So that's where I find strategies exciting of can we mix that business and IT and really create something new that wasn't there before. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Nigel to talk a little bit about, you know, it might be new to you, what are we talking about when we talk about a strategy? Uh, so Nigel, I'll pass it to you. Okay, thanks, Donna. Yeah, Donna highlighted earlier, I think, what some of the what we regard as some of the key components of a data strategy. But I think it's important in the context of what we're talking about is that everyone understands the relationship between a business strategy and a data strategy. And as Donna said, in any data-driven company, these two strategies now become increasingly interdependent. Um, so what we've done here is just put up some pretty simple definitions of what we think a business strategy is and what we think a data strategy is. And if you look at those definitions, you'll see that they've got quite a lot in common, um, both of which are fundamentally plans of action or roadmaps, usually encompass a two to five year time frame because these days that's about as far as a horizon that can be realistically anticipated or planned for, given the pace of change in both the business world and of course in new technology. Um, a, a, a basically, a business strategy lays out what the business is trying to achieve and how it intends to do it. And you know, from this, there should be some very clear, uh, actionable goals and objectives. And it needs to take into account in its business strategy external trends which impact the organisation. For example, what's, what, what is the competition doing? How is the market changing? But also internal drivers. So what new products do we want to put into the market? How are we going to make our processes more efficient? What new skills do we need, etc.? So that's a business strategy. And a data strategy, you know, in many ways very similar. 
Um, a data strategy should also be a plan, which means that it should contain clear and measurable goals and objectives. I've seen some data strategies that don't work simply because they're statements of intent without any clear uh, milestones or clear activities contained within them. And the difference of the data strategy, obviously, is about how the data used by an organization, whether it's internally generated or externally sourced, uh, should be managed and enhanced to make it fit for the changing purposes of the business, how it should be controlled, how it should be made secure, and how both business and IT should be looking to maximize its value um, and exploiting it as fully as possible. So clear, there are clear links between these two things. And if you look at the, the relationship between the two, I think probably you could have argued a few years ago that data strategies were very much the subservient partner. Um, the business would set its strategy. Um, that strategy would inform and guide the IT people very often who are responsible for the data strategy. They would put some sort of data strategy in place, and then in turn, and that would that would basically be it. But I think I think in the in the day of the data driven um, enterprise, as Donna said, then clearly these two strategies must must be joined at the hip. And in fact, rather than the data strategy simply being the passive recipient of a, of a business strategy, it should be actively part of the business strategy itself in terms of evolving the business strategy. Give you an example. Uh, the business strategy might say, we want to sell a new product to our top 100,000 customers. Um, that's a fine, that's a clear business objective. Um, but the data strategy must therefore demonstrate how you're going to identify who these top 100,000 customers are how are you going to target them, and how are you going to effectively market to them? So it's very much become a two-way dependency, an, in, an integral dependency. That means as well, of course, that new technologies and new use of data can actually suggest new things that the business can actually do and achieve. So for example, selling more via social media channels, creating customer communities of interest, or simply using technology to better analyze customer behavior, and so the organization can react but they must be joined at the hip. So what's, what, what's the relationship between these and data models? What I try to do here, and I would stress that this is very much a simplified view, and that in any real organization, obviously, the derivation of a data strategy is, is usually a, a lot more complex than this. But I think what it does do is highlight some of the key activities that need to be carried out in order to ensure that you have a joined up business strategy and a joined up data strategy. Um, the other thing I would stress as well is don't read this from left to right to some sort of uh, waterfall process because it's clearly iterative, as I've mentioned earlier. So you, you, you arrive at an initial data strategy, you revisit the business strategy, which might in turn change the data strategy, which might in turn change the business strategy. So the two things definitely come together. But I think what this, what this simple diagram does do is it suggests that if you're going to have an effective data strategy, you need two primary starting points. I think first, as Donna has emphasized as well, that you know, the business strategy, the business goals, and also from that, the key data needs that the business has to achieve its business goals need to be known, understood, and clearly laid out. But then second starting point underneath is clearly as well, in this strategy, in a data strategy, you need to know what data you're actually going to encompass within the strategy. I mean, every organization has more data than you can throw a stick at. So what's really important is that you focus on the data that really matters to support the business. You prioritize your, 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 your efforts on that. And then, you pri and then similarly, once you've done that prioritization, you, you then make the relevant investment of time, resource, money into enhancing and improving the data that really matters to the business. And I think that's, that's an absolutely critical thing to do in any data strategy. And sometimes where I've seen data strategies go wrong is when they fail to do that. But if you try and have an all-encompassing data strategy that changes every, every, all data within the organization, then by doing that, in effect, you end up changing nothing because it simply gets spread too thinly. So the key point about all this is the use of clear, uh, identifying clear data priorities, being very clear about what that data means, and we'll come back to that when we talk about data definitions, understanding how good that data is now, how it's held, how it's stored, how it's accessed, then defining to meet the business strategy what that data needs to look like. So the data strategy, in effect, becomes a roadmap to link uh, the to be picture of the world with the current picture of the world and the activities that that, that that involves. So what I will now do is go back to Donna, and Donna's going to talk a little bit more about that bottom bit about defining the, the, uh, the business uh, data model and how that's done, Donna. 
Great, thanks. So as I mentioned, the beauty of a data model is it has both that top-down and then the bottom-up. So I'm going to go a little more deeply on what that means. So if you're in data modeling, this type of uh, pyramid probably makes sense to you, but I'll go through it quickly. So uh, the data modeling isn't just one thing. Uh, there's different types of data models and different audiences. So And people have different terms for all of these. I actually, in, a, in the data modeling for the business book with Steve we did a, and, and Chris, we did a survey, um, and there was no one consensus, but the general consensus with conceptual, logical, physical in terms of the names. Um, but what they do, at the conceptual level, really you're defining the business concepts of uh, an organization. So the audience here is business stakeholders, and I listed that explicitly because the, the purpose is to communicate and define key business terms and rules. At the lower level, you have a physical data model. Well, that purpose is to technically implement a physical database, and your audience is going to be DBAs, developers, you know, technical folks. Um, and where I've things, seen things going wrong is you, you generally, unless you've got a very, very technical and very interested business user, don't show them the physical data model. Um, and I, I could have a whole presentation on this, um, of, of catering the model to your stakeholder. Um, but even at the logical level, so that's that sort of nice mix of you're going a little de deeper than at the conceptual level. It really is, as, as Nigel mentioned, defining what you, you can't define everything in the organization. What are your key business concepts, your key data that drives the business, and what are the definitions of that? And if you've gone through this, you'll realize um, that there's some basic definitions that might need to be clarified. What do you mean by something as simple as month? Is it fiscal month? Is it calendar month? The number of customers I've gone into with severe data problems, and, and the res resolution is often something as, quote, simple as that. You know, it's common definitions that each each term, each group has different financial results because they were using different terms of, of region or you know, et cetera, et cetera. So this is very important, and those definitions are important. At the logical level, you go one level deeper. So you are defining things like data entities and attributes and the business rules. It's sort of your first cut for that physical database. You are sort of starting to think at the physical layer. It isn't a physical model. There's clear differences, um, but it's somewhere in between. And again, depending on your audience, I wouldn't necessarily show that to a business user. Um, Generally, the audience is more of a business analyst, which should be able to understand uh, both the business and IT, or a data architect, or, or that type of team. So we'll show some examples, um, but it kind of shows you also see that this is a pyramid. So in terms of volume, when you get down to the physical layer, yes, you may have thousands of tables um, for necessity, because that's what's running the business. When you get up to the conceptual layer, it, simplicity is key. So what are those t 10 basic concepts that run the business, and it really should fit on one page. We've worked in some large international organizations. Maybe it is the top 20 entities that we're really using to run the business. Um, you know, it might be slightly bigger than that, but the goal is simplicity, not complexity here. Uh, so a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> here are some examples of what, and, and again, I think especially at the, and I'll talk more about this, at the conceptual model level, keep it loose. The, the, the goal is communication in getting those business rules, and I'll talk more about that when you're talking about a customer here. A customer is a person or organization who's rented a movie within the past year. Well, wait a minute. We sell actually only to people. We don't sell to organizations, B2B. Well, that's a great that You called that out because you showed the definitions right here. You know, there's some cardinality. There's some business rules. There may be. There, you might show attributes. But again, the goal is, def A, defining those key concepts that are important to the business, getting the definitions, and starting to get the, the idea of relationships. Um, can a customer make more than one payment on a, a single credit line, et cetera? All of these rules that start to define the business start to be fleshed out here. At the logical model level, that's where you are getting more technical. So yes, you do want to have your keys and your data types and your you know your full cardinality probably start normalizing. Yeah, that's really it's doing two things. It is defining business rules. Often, it is a precursor to that physical design. Um, I'm not going to go down to the physical model level. Um, I wanted, did want to talk more about the the business model, um, and I am a big fan of this type of model. And and okay, the first time I did this, I sort of even laughed at myself. So I kind of call this a graphical data model. Was this too simple? Um, was my fear. I'm a big fan because it really helps define the business in the big picture, um, and, and it isn't meant, you know, some of the modeling tools, you can put a picture here. I often literally do it in Visio. It's meant as a conversation piece. So again, this wouldn't be your final data model, but it started the conversation. Okay, I've heard terms like customer. I've heard terms like client. 
when I talk to support, they talk about clients. When I talk about sales, they talk about customers. Is that the same thing? Or, or is it, you know, once you've gotten a maintenance contract, you're now a client, and when you're still a prospect, you're a customer? In this case, maybe it is the same person. I, I literally had the same picture of a person, right? Um, a salesperson talks to a customer, maybe you should call that prospect. Uh, are there are there late things like the concept of householding? Could you want to get the relationships between this customer is the father of this customer and create those relationships? Um, what are we selling as a product? Um, so I've actually I've actually been in the room and you start to show this to a business person and their eyes light up. I've had feedback and again it might sound um, uh, sort of fluff at, at top. But when someone said um, actually the, we had a customer like this, could you make the customer a little older? You know, you should have laughed, like, but not really, because they were actually doing a campaign to try to get um, older, retired, high net worth individuals, and that was the customer, which was a very different campaign to a follow-up campaign that they wanted a picture of someone like this with headphones, because it was more of a social media-driven type marketing campaign. So this is a data model, but it made it very real. Or you could say product, and they say, well, that's a box. We don't sell product. We actually sell services. We call it a product, uh, but it's actually a service. You know, so a lot of this brings it home. Um, I've also used it to uh, fairly business-level people that sort of understood um, the need for data, probably didn't understand the complexity. And when you start showing these arrows, that sort of helped when we're trying to say you need to build something like a warehouse, and it's relationships that are complex. That really turned the light bulb on for them. So I've found this, and I've, I've put it in presentations and wanted to take it out, and folks said, no, no, keep it. That really explains our business. And I often do it myself when I go into a customer, and I might not show it to them initially, but it helps me understand their business. What is their business? And I start to draw out the entities and relationships and often do a picture because it helps me. This really should describe the business. So I'm a fan of this. This probably is not uh, your typical third normal form database, so data modeling vendors might cringe. Um, but I've just seen it work, and I, I would think about doing this, whether you show it to your audience or just do it yourself. I think this really explains that a data model drives your business. So I spent a little bit of time on that, but I think it's a little different approach that I thought folks might want to try. So I've shared my secret with you now. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit about creative ways. So this was one creative way to try to get the business involved, because when you talk about a high-level data model. It really is whatever way you're going to get those definitions, get the business rules from the business. Another great way is, is whiteboarding that Nigel and I have used. So I'm going to pass it over to Nigel to talk more about that. Okay, thanks, Dotter. And I guess this is about as low-tech an approach as you can possibly get to data modeling. But I personally know no better way of starting to generate the sort of business concept models that Donna's been talking about. Um, basically, the only equipment you need, as you can see there, is a whiteboard, some post-it notes, and a few pens, preferably erasable ones, so that you can move the post-it notes around and connect, connect them and join them in, in, in the different ways that Donna mentioned earlier. And of course, the big advantage of this low-tech approach is that you can gather a load of business people and a load of IT people run, around a single whiteboard and get them to collaborate and work together to begin to flesh out the data model. And I found in particular the business people appreciate this and they begin to get modeling and they begin to get what data modeling is all about and why it's important. Of course, the other advantage of doing modeling this way is that as Donna mentioned earlier, and I've seen this happen as well in companies I've worked in, um, people start to question what these things actually mean. So somebody will say, well, what, what do you mean by a policy? Well, I mean something different. I, a, you, you, you define a policy as a way of a sort of business rule for how to manage certain data sets. I regard a policy as a written document we must adhere to. So already you come up with the differences in the definitions, which is very useful for reasons that we'll come to later. But the point of all this is it gets people to work together collaboratively. And at the end of the exercise, which can be completed pretty quickly, I've seen a whole business data model fleshed out in a couple of hours using this. You've got a clear starting point and a baseline that which you can then start to build more conceptual data models. Once you've done that, then what do you do next? Well, the first thing that, the thing that you need to do, which Don has already alluded to, is in, in, in any data model and in any data strategy, as we said earlier, you have to start to identify the, the data that the business really depends on to succeed. And um, what data is critical now and critical for future uh, success as well? What data is known to be deficient and needs attention, for example? What new data do we, do, does a company need to acquire or create? And here's, here's a very simple example of that. There's a new product launch that the company wants to do needs to run a marketing campaign, and it knows it needs better customer information. So in order to make that uh, marketing campaign a success, what it needs to do is filter and focus on those elements, on those data areas, data objects that are really important. 
and there are five that we've listed there. And uh, how do you identify what those five are? Well, there are a number of different ways of doing it. Some of the techniques we've already talked about is one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is you simply go around and talk to people and you ask them what data they really depend on and what really matters to them. So stakeholder interviews, stakeholder workshops are always a good way to, to flesh these out. Of course, another way of doing it is you start analyzing business processes and start to understand how key data um, interacts with the processes that the company is running. And what data does it, is it important to get right? And what data perhaps doesn't it matter too much if it's not right? You know, if, if for example, you hold customers' telephone numbers and you know those telephone numbers aren't very good, but you stopped telephoning customers two years ago anyway, because now you contact them by social media or email. So it doesn't really matter. So that's the way that you can start to focus and prioritize. And uh, just to give you an example of this, Don and I worked with a major UK energy company last year and using an approach like this, understanding what was really key to their future business, they distilled all their key data down to around 120 objects and attributes. So that isn't data entities or data objects, that includes the attributes as well. And so they decided that if they, they came to the conclusion, if they got those 123 entities and attributes right, then the rest could really manage itself and that the whole business and the success of the business and its data depending upon those 120 items. And so all their improvement and governance efforts have been placed on that ever since. And it's, it's showing rewards for them. Um, and then the next thing, once you've identified what these key data objects and attributes are, and Donna's already mentioned this as well, it's really, really important that you get some very clear definitions of what that data means. And my definition of, uh, of a data definition is simply a unique way of identifying, describing a key data element or a group of data elements. And without having clear, agreed definitions of key data, uh, organizations are a bit like Bruegel's famous painting here, the Tower of Babel. They all think they're speaking the same language, but actually they're not. And it's that confusion of language and cultural difference that can often cause a lot of problems when you're trying to build data strategies. And uh, just to move on to the next slide, you know, here's some examples of things that Donna and I have come across in, in, in some of the work that we've done and some of the questions people keep being asked all the time. You know, what is a household? How do we define a monthly calendar? Donna's already mentioned that one. What the hell is a PEG ratio? Does that mean the same thing to everybody? <coughs> Excuse me. And in the uh, energy company that we worked in last year, you know, we had the classic example of what do we mean by a customer? Because somebody from marketing who was in a workshop that I was in said, well, it's someone who we target in our campaigns. And then somebody in sales said, no, actually, we define it as somebody who actually buys a product or service from us. And then finance said, well, for us, it's somebody who pays the invoices and pays the bills. And of course, if you're dealing with business customers, then those people are often different from the people who actually buy the service. And then somebody piped in from engineering said, well, for me, it's somebody who requires some service and support from my operations team. So you ended up very quickly in that workshop with understanding that there was a significant fundamental misunderstanding or, or difference of opinion as to what a customer was. So resolving those sorts of issues and being aware of them is absolutely critical when you're actually building a data strategy. And there are lots of other benefits, I think, that come from this as well. And I've listed some of them there, and I won't read through them all. Um, I think we've already hammered the point home that a good data strategy just focuses on the data that really matters now and in the future to the business. Of course, once you've got, once you've got clear definitions, that helps you to build business rules and therefore enforce data standards on the key data that really matters. You can then also decide what data you need to focus on in terms of monitoring it and improving. Um, and it helps you to do that as well. Uh, and obviously as well as if some of those data items that we talked about are subject to legal or regulatory control, then that's a good way as well of proving the provenance of the data and showing you're being compliant with, with law and regulation. The other thing we found is very useful as well once you do this is that you can actually publish and, and make, make other people across the whole organization aware aware of what data really matters to the company and actually encourage them to focus on getting that data right. So what I'll do now is pass back to Donna again, who will explore the more technical bottom-up side of how a data model can help develop these strategies. Thanks. Um, and so, yeah, I mentioned at the beginning that they are both equally important and inextricably linked of the top-down, the bottom-up. So I think we gave a good explanation of the, the top-down and how a data model can really help prioritize, understand, describe, get buy-in from the business, et cetera. 
But that doesn't help unless you really understand your tactical environment, because at the end of the day, that's what's actually running the business. So um, one of the great things about a data model is the majority of data modeling tools out there, unless you're using something, you know, just like a, a drawing tool, um, is that it can help create what I like to call an active inventory of data assets. But let's just start with the inventory part. So I, you know, at many companies I work for, there is, you know, hundreds or thousands of databases, and, and there is often the case, I sort of joked about it earlier, but, you know, Bob built this database 20 years ago, no clue what's in it. Or uh, think of some of the packaged applications, like an SAP, um, where there may have been modifications, and I really don't know what that uh, data model looks like and what the business definitions are. Uh, so most data modeling tools can reverse engineer and create a logical and sometimes even a, um, I mean, sorry, a physical and sometimes even a logical model to understand what those data structures are. So at the very basic of know what data you have, what is an inventory of those systems? You know, a lot of the data modeling tools are very advanced now, and you can start to do um, some rationalization as well because, you know, often we've sort of alluded to this already, you might have you know, 200 customer databases and 170 of them define customer in a different way. You know, even as something as simple as how do I have my name field or my surname field, um, are they done different ways? And that leads to data quality and integration. And if you're on this call, you probably understand a lot of that already. But that is a lot of the pain points of a lot of these data quality issues. Again, we can, you know, so, so many of these problems seem so simple at the outset. You know, why do we all have a different definition of customer on the business side? But that that's just um, uh, even exponentially <laughs> true on the physical side. And by the way, not only do we have a different definition of customer, but the way we store customer names is different in 17 different systems. Uh, so just trying to get that to make sense and creating the standards around that um, can be a challenge. So you know, knowing what data, I kind of sum it, knowing what data you have is creating that inventory and, and knowing what those structures look like. Um, know what your data means. Um, so the beauty of these model layers is that a lot of these, that hard work we did, you know, so just to be clear, we're a big fan of sticky notes and pictures and all that stuff to get the requirements, but we're not saying that's your final, I don't want anyone to go out there tweeting saying Donna should, says I should build my enterprise data model on a sticky note. No, that's just a, a, a way to, to, to get the conversation going, and then yes, you put that in the data model, and there's metadata in those models that not only has the physical, but the, the business as well. And it supports that data consistency. So. A, can you identify problems that there's 17 different version ways of storing first name? And then can I create, and, and Nigel will talk a little bit more about this in the governance piece, but the, can we create domains and data standards uh, so that doesn't happen again? Uh, so there's kind of two ways for a data model. There's the bottom up of I want to understand what my data is and create a model from it, and there's also the top down of say for new development or, or data model or data management changes, can I define that first name should be done this way or I want to add a certain field, I'm going to do it from the data model. So that's why I call it an active inventory. Uh, it's not just a passive picture of your database environment, it's an active um, living, breathing document um, that can actually be used real time. So, and as I mentioned before, metadata is key to adding the context and definition around these. Yeah, you know, I won't beat this to death. This idea that we've already talked about of the definitions. You know, is the last name a surname, family name? Um, you know, in, in China, is it maybe different? We we have the last name first or in our in the American way. Um, a listed city is where the customer lives or where the store is located, et cetera. So I think we've beat that one to death. So I won't continue, although it is important. Um, but the beauty of a data model is you can mix that with also the technical. You know, what format is this in? Is it character 30? What, what is the standard abbreviation on the physical database? So any of you who have reverse engineered from a physical model, you'll see that it could be you know, table X3 with columns C1, C2, C3. Well, that's not very helpful. <laughs> so if we're going to abbreviate name, can we all abbreviate it the same way? You know, are these required fields? Um, is it nullable? Is it required? You know, all those technical metadata uh, are important. So there's both business and technical metadata. So your technical metadata is you know, your DDL, your whether this is nullable, what the, what the data types are, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then the business definition are these terms and, and definitions. A subset, there's a lot more than this. And as you know, the data is the actual data, you know, the fact that John Smith is a customer and that he has an employee ID. Um, just a little bit on metadata because I'm a fan. Um, the other thing that uh, data models can help with is the data lineage. So there's sort of the defined metadata that either was defined in the structure of a database that you're either defining in your model or reverse engineering and discovering. Um, and then there's sort of a lot of things behind the scenes. Uh, and again, the data modeling tools either integrate with other tools or in themselves get, are getting much more savvy in how to do some of this in, in their own tool. 
is this idea of a lot of folks that are doing uh, data modeling are doing it for data warehousing. So this idea of lin lineage, you know, so for example, I have this term sales amount on my BI report or my data warehouse. You know, it started out on three, this is definitely a subset of a real environment. Um, it started out on three different databases, Oracle, SQL Server, DB2. We kind of transformed it through ETL, put it in a staging area, created a warehouse. How, what are the rules around that? What, what was the initial field and how did that get transformed? So a lot of data modeling tools or metadata repositories can track that lineage as the metadata so that you can see when someone does, we have, we're in this business meeting and they say, that's not how I define sales amount. Well, we can actually see how that was calculated. Or if there's a discrepancy, well, we took it from this Oracle database. Well, that was the sales database that, uh, I mean, that, you know, that was the support database. You shouldn't be calculating sales from that. That is totally different metadata. So it helps you understand where that data came from when you're doing things like auditing um, or understanding a data warehouse. Um, or these, these data model design relationships, one of the nice things about defining all of these terms in a data model is that you can do that, what I like to call a semantic link linkage. So say, for instance, in the conceptual model, we decide that it was called client, and that's what they business people use. Well, in all the databases, it might be called customer. For now, we're just going to keep it. You know, Maybe you want to rationalize these two. Maybe you don't. But at least you can link that the fact that client is customer at a logical level. But probably more commonly, um, they have the idea of on, on Oracle, it's custom. Teradata is customer. It's Ctable 16 and DB2. So either you create standards or at a minimum, you can link that when we talk about customer, it, it's links to all of these different physical systems. Then when you do want to make a change, um, you can see that you know linkage and how it maps to the business terms. And that's one of the beauties of do, doing both the business and the technical in a data model because you, by definition, the metadata and this lineage is stored in the model. You don't have to go back. You know, if, you know, take some effort to link these. I'm not saying it's just magic, press the button. Uh, you have to have a little bit of rigor in how you build these models. Uh, but especially at the logical, physical level, uh, it's very nice to have a map of the term customer is actually Im implemented technically on these different platforms in a certain way. Um, so it's a little bit of the technical. I mean, that that is the beauty, again, of, of uh, the top down and the bottom up as they meld nicely together, and hopefully that gave you some examples of that. Why do we care? I thought it would be helpful, especially when we're talking about a strategy. Usually you do a strategy for something, right? We're going to do a strategy. As a result of that, we need to clean up our data quality, or we want to build a new warehouse to report on customer metrics. So how does the data model fit in that? And I think that's kind of where the rubber hits the road. And we want to give some examples of things we use uh, a data model for. So I already talked about a data model for data warehousing and business intelligence, probably a fairly common use case. Um, but just kind of full that story because the data modeling fits in in a lot of places. And unfortunately, we don't always, we, data modeling people, don't always get you know front and stage center. So a frustration, and it could be, not that I'm ever bitter, but <laughs> you know the BI tool is a big flashy, that's what people see. You know, they see this flashy report and some pretty colors, and this is the answers they want. I want all my customers by region. Well, there was a lot of work to get that nice report. And the data model, that's why I like this term here, we're kind of the intelligence behind in business intelligence. All those rules, all those structures, all that hard work that made your nice, pretty report. Hey, that's us. You know, we're here. <laughs> What's that movie, Horton? Here's a who. You know, we're here. We're here. We're behind. We're behind your model. So the good news is we're necessary. The bad news is if you want to be front and center, you're probably not um, in terms of what the business sees. Um, but you know, you can see the frustration from like a business person. Could you just show me all my customers by region? You know, how hard can that be? Can I have it by this afternoon? Uh, they probably don't understand um, that that customer data is in 17,000 source system you need to rationalize and get it get it right uh, before you put it in a warehouse and then build cubes and build your report. So a data model can help at a many stages as we've beaten to death at this point. You know, what is the definite customer? Is it prospective customers people have already bought? You know, where is the data stored? Yes, we can get that information, but it's in 17 sources. How is it structured? It's all structured differently. We need to have common um, you know, rules. Who uses the data? Who owns the data? If I have a question, who goes to it? Is, is it private? Is this PII information? You know, all the stuff around the information, and that you probably build your conceptual, logical, physical, relational models to find that. Um, then you, when, you go, when you want to get to the data warehouse level, that's your the good old dimensional model. You know, your kind of star schema, or whether you're you're Inman or Kimball, whichever one you wish, uh, you could still build that in a data model, and that kind of helps different questions. You know, what are the definitions of these key business terms? Do they match these, or are they slightly different? What do I want to report on? How do I optimize the database to start building these reports? So the good news is that a data model really can and should be used at all of these layers to help answer that question, can you show me all my customers by region? Um, so very, very relevant in that kind of environment. 
Um, data modeling for enterprise architecture, uh, I want to spend a little time on this. I think, I oh, my rant, and, and Shannon can hit me with a, a verbal cue if I go too far, because I tend to rant about certain things. Uh, but uh, enterprise architecture often gets a bad rap. And it's sort of like, I guess, business, even data warehousing does. Is it too fast? Is it too, does it take too long? Well, I think all of us in the industry need to be more, ad, and be more agile. When we talk about things like whiteboarding, you know, don't go back to the business and say, yes, we can give you a conceptual model in six months after we've had stakeholder interviews and design sessions. And that's not going to fly, whether it ever flew. Um, I think people want to see faster results. So we have to think of being more agile. Um, so no, building a big enterprise architecture just for the academic reason for it and taking three years to get there, I think is not in vogue. Um, I think the underpinnings of enterprise architecture very much are. So I think like data warehousing, enterprise architecture can often be seen as a little too academic and this rapid, we need to build a, something in big data quickly. Um, but I think there's some key things we need to do um, that shouldn't be left out at any phase. We might do them more agilely, we might do it on a whiteboard, but I still think we still need to think of all these process, uh, these linkages. And I mentioned it earlier. So this is what we've done. And I think depending on the industry, um, the rigor behind this, so we've built this soup to nuts probably using every one of these artifacts at the bottom for a pharmaceutical company. Um, it was a water treatment plant that were very processed, you know, when we think of engineering, very process driven. Um, actually, the, the water treatment plant actually had a great success story that there was an issue uh, with some contamination in one of their systems. Um, and because they had detailed process models and data models, they were within hours able to pinpoint the issue and solve it um, because they had everything well documented. You very rarely get great data model and process model success stories like that. And unfortunately, it's because they had a problem. Um, but they actually got a whole lot more funding <laughs> to build process and data models and link them together because they saw the value. Similar with the pharmaceutical, comp pharmaceutical company, they were actually able to optimize their research and development process by taking a look at the processes and the data. So I think you know, going that level of detail is more of an engineering task, still valuable. If you're a sales organization or maybe a nonprofit or something, I, you may not want to go as deeply, but you should still do this. And I'll walk through what this is. Um, so the business view, we've sort of talked about that. We have some artifacts in our practice, things called like a motivation model. You know, What are you trying to do? What are the motivations of the company? What are your business capabilities? What are your business drivers? This is basically the what are we trying to do and what my business looks like. Process view is sort of self-describing, but that's you know the actual process. How do we build a product? How do we sell to a customer? Do they go to the website and then they enter information? This is key, especially when we're talking about data quality. Often a data quality issue is process. Did, did, did the sales rep enter the right information? Can we pre-fill that information from external data so they won't make mistakes? Can we use the data model to do drop-down fields so that if the state code is you know uh, U.S. state, give them the proper list. If it's yes, no, build a domain <laughs> with some values. Um, I won't start the rant, but I've been on, I was actually on a data quality webinar uh, where I went to register and they had uh, free form text fields for everything, you know, even, <laughs> even you know, your, your, your U.S. state. And I, I think I tweeted about that one because that just stuff shouldn't happen anymore. You're just causing um, issues and that can all be solved through a data model. And then the data view, which I think we've talked about, the conceptual, uh, logical, you know, business glossary. We didn't talk about this specifically, but that's often built from a data model. Uh, a lot of the data modeling tools out there now can take your conceptual or logical models, think of your entity and attribute definitions, and just publish them out to the web uh, so the business people can see. So you've already have this beauty of a data model is that a lot of the information other processes need is in the model. Just publish it. And then linking it all together, this ma mapping data to process. Um, I've used CRUD analysis where the data is created, read, updated, and deleted. Very valuable. And again, whether you do this detailed or just at a high level, who who's using the data? When is it updated? When is it read? How is it used? So seeing data and data models in the context of the bigger picture is very valuable. And I spend a lot of time on this, but I'm a, a big fan, and we've seen uh, success in a lot of industries. So I'm going to pass it over to Nigel for some of the other business areas that can use the data model. Yeah, thanks, Donna, and I'm conscious of time, so that um, I'll work through these quite quickly. But um, one of the one of the areas certainly where data models have a big part to play is if your data strategy contains any cloud ambitions, i.e., moving data and/or applications to the cloud. Um, there are some cloud vendors out there and some exponents of cloud who will say to you, "You don't need to worry about data models in the world of cloud because you just pass all your data to a cloud provider and they'll sort all that out for you." Um, and that's a dangerous fallacy. Uh, and, and so data models are really important here because remember, whatever your data is physically stored, wherever your apps are, are physically run from, it's still your data and you're still responsible for it. So if you put personally sensitive data or secure data into the cloud and it's compromised, for example, ultimately the buck will stop with you 
um, and not with a cloud provider. Uh, and there are lots of issues as well if you put your data out to cloud providers, for example, who move, might move that data around because, as you know, there are the, the ideas of safe harbors and that certain personally identifiable information, for instance, within Europe can only be held within safe harbor companies and safe harbor companies. Um, companies and countries, I should have said. So data models are really important in terms of identifying which data is it okay to put out to the cloud and which data should we keep in-house and store in-house. That's one of, one of, the, one of the key uh, benefits of a data model in, in your cloud strategies. Similarly, for um, application development, um, Basically, um, the advent of Agile techniques, particularly uh, uh, the key mantra, of course, of Agile is reuse. And if you've got data models and associated metadata and the sort of business glossaries and definitions that Donna and I have talked about, then these are key tools in helping to ensure that the data that you actually hold is reused and not recreated in you know your various plethora of, of Agile projects that you might be running um, with the danger that you know if you let them run in an anarchistic way, then you've got uncontrolled data duplication, data proliferation, and general data anarchy. And of course, all these things can undermine any, any well-intentioned data strategy. And of course, with the now the growing development of an adoption of DevOps, you know, which is an approach that, that stresses the need for close collaboration of application development, testing, and operations, um, you, the ability to reuse existing data sources is critical if DevOps is to succeed because you know, it's trying to establish this culture where building, testing, releasing software is all done very quickly, very frequently, and very reliable. So having a good picture of your data is absolutely key to making that happen. And then moving on to the importance of modeling in master data management. I'm sure most of you on this call are familiar with what MDM is. And it's about identifying, creating single data sources that are where data is in principle held once and reused many times by many different applications. And clearly, um, I think this one's more self-evident, you can't achieve master data management unless you're very clear about what data is relevant and in scope to what you're trying to do and what you define as master data, what it means, how its definitions, what its qualities like. So no MDM initiative can succeed without clear definitions of data, what the objects are, what the attributes are, and so data modeling has an important part to play here. And also critical for MDM is data governance. And you need clear business ownership and stewardship of master data in order to um, help you define what your master data needs to look like. So the final sort of link, if you like, with other data disciplines is this key one between data modeling and data governance. And, and data governance is founded on the pretty key principles of which you see on this slide. It's the idea of data as an asset needs to be managed accordingly. It needs to be subject to the same disciplines as finance or, uh, uh, and other HR and other activities within, within an organization. And data models can help greatly to, 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 to underpin a successful data governance program because, you know, first of all, it helps you define standards and domains that you apply the rules to. It helps you to identify who the right owners of the data are. So, for example, you know, should we have a data steward who's responsible for all our customer data? Should we have a, several stewards who deal with that data in different countries, for example, if you're a global company? Also helps you with things, as John mentioned earlier, about the importance of lineage and, and uh, data updates. So ultimately, data modeling is, is key to a successful data governance program as well. And I will hand back to Donna, I think it was going to summarize uh, the webinar. Donna. Sure. So um, hopefully we made clear so far um, kind of where, if, like, what, a, what a strategy is, why it's valuable, and where a data model can fit. So you know, at the, at the business level, it's defining the business strategy and then using that conceptual data model to prioritize and understand the main business concepts. At the physical data model level, it's really understanding your technical environment. And then, well, maybe it's not too academic, but everything in the middle, right? This whole data modeling ecosystem from the metadata management for your, 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 your data integration and lineage, as well as what we just talked about, things like master data management, data warehousing, really defend, depend on a, a model to make things valuable. And governance, which to me probably is the most closely linked. When we're thinking of having domains and business rules and data standards, that's what data modeling is all about and it's been all about for many, many years. So not only on the technical side, uh, but also on the business side, as, as Nigel mentioned, with things like stewardship. So the beauty of a data model, again, I'm a big fan, um, is from that both top down and bottom up and everything in between of really creating that holistic view of your organization and making it actionable. Um, we talked about that a bit, the top down, bottom up, and how it fits. 
um, a little bit quickly about us. Uh, we do this for a living, so as my sales pitch. If you need help, let us know. Um, but that really is our passion about how you take a, a data and make it make your business transformed through data, which is kind of fun. Um, my other shameless plug. Um, well, here's just our contact information. I guess a shameless plug to our respective uh, data management chapters. If you're not involved in DAMA, it's a great nonprofit organization that's free to join. So there's our uh, either DAMA, DAMA Rocky Mountain chapter, DAMA UK, or DAMA.org, which is the global chapter. And my da uh, shameless plug for our metadata course. So Dataversity has actually a full uh, course load and is building more. Um, so we just launched one on metadata management. If you're on this webinar, you get to use our discount code, which you do have 20% off, and get a set of Ginsu knives if you register sure now, right? Did that sound too salesy? Um, but seriously, there is a, a helpful course on metadata management. There's also two. There's one on data governance and one on data quality, and you can actually use that discount code for those as well. So take a look out at trainingdataversity.net. Um, kind of fun. I've actually taken both of the other courses, and they're very good. Um, so just another plug for the rest of the series. I saw a couple questions coming in on data modeling for big data, which is, is next month. We'll talk more about that. So please join the rest of the series if you can. Um, and it looks like we've got a few minutes left uh, for questions. And I'm going to actually request questions before we ask the other ones. So of course, the questions on the webinar today. Um, if you are, I saw some other topics, whether we answer them today or next week. Um, specifically, do you want to hear about big data and data modeling for next month? Uh, let us know. Um, and we've got a lot of topics for next year's lineup or other suggestions. But if there's something you're just dying to hear about, about data modeling that you want us to talk about or write about in blogs, um, just drop that in the, the notes. So without further ado, um, I will open up to questions. I think, Shannon, you were monitoring those. Yes, and, and what a great way to kick off the, the new data modeling series. This was great um, uh, presentation from both of you. Thank you so much. We've got a lot of great questions coming in, um, and I will get to those. And of course, the most popular question, the most common question are people asking about copies of the slides and the recording. I will send a follow-up email within two business days, so by end of day Monday for this webinar, with links to both of those, along with any additional information and some of the information that Don has provided here in the presentation. Um, so first question coming in for, uh, I'll let either or both of you answer, um, how does the logical conceptual models align with NoSQL big data database technologies? And again, as you mentioned, we are uh, going to be covering that a bit more um, next month in depth, but uh, is there a quick something, answer that you want to provide yeah, that? I I will, because that's a common question, and actually they fit very nicely. So especially at the conceptual model level, that should be completely technology neutral. So you shouldn't be talking about technology at all at that point. So that would cover everything, right? That we're looking to get customer information. And then when we get down to the logical information, that gets a little more detailed. And Nigel picked, uh, touched on this as well. You manage everything. You don't manage everything in the same way in the organization. So when you get down to that logical level, that's where you're saying things like, you know, if we're going to build a warehouse and we need to have customer name and address, um, you know, I don't know, social security number in the U.S., we need to get that right. And we need to make sure that's closely monitored and governed. We might want social media hashtag and maybe some trending analysis on big data. Very different governance around that. And that's really at those levels, the conceptual logical levels, um, is where you can start to define the different governance structures. So conceptual, that should be, even if you never even built a database, you should, that could still a helpful effort to talk about your data. And then at the logical level, I think that's where you can get more granulated, of, granular on um, what should be managed in, in closely or not. And you do, the, que the question I person did not talk about physical, but that's possible as well, and I don't want to um, get too much into next month. But there are layers, you know, hive layers. Again, that's part of that logical and conceptual model of once you have everything out on something like Hadoop, certain things you do want modeled more co closely. Think of it as a discovery platform. This is everything. And then what is it that we really want to model more closely and put on the warehouse? So they kind of work together. So I think even more with big data, you want to really just define at that high level what the data is, what it means, and how it should be managed. So I don't know, Nigel, did you have other thoughts you wanted to add on that? Yeah, I would just agree with that, Donna. Just to add, really, I mean, I've seen lots of examples, I think, of where no SQL databases and the so-called data lakes in Hadoop are rapidly becoming data swamps because that, that analysis hasn't been done up front and there are no clear definitions of some of the terms and some of the data held within there. So then people go in there and trying to do some analysis of what's, what's, what's actually within the data lake. Uh, they really don't know what they're finding. So um, I think some degree of modeling, control, metadata management of these things, and governance as well, um, is actually critically important. And I'll, I'll chime in again, because uh, you picked on a good thing. I mean, I've been working with a lot of big data lakes and, and data, uh, data scientists. 
when we do kind of these stakeholder interviews that Nigel mentioned, no, and actually Nigel on another presentation, we had some great statistics. You know, the number one complaint from these data scientists is, I don't have document. You know, it's great you can munge all the data and do statistical analysis, but you still need to know what the data means. You know, is, what, is this a customer? When you mean state, is it the state of affairs? Is it the mental state? Is it the state they live in? You know, all of that needs to be defined, and I think even more so now that we're doing this more volumes of data. It doesn't go away. You still need to do the, the modeling or at least the, the metadata definitions. Yeah. All right. Well, we have less than a minute here, but I do want to just get in at least one more question. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, the benefits and how companies are able to prove the benefits of having a model, but do you have statistics that illustrate the ROI of using a data model and implementing a data strategy compared to projects that occur without them? Well, did you want to take uh, the statistics, man, Nigel? Do you want to take that one? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, to answer your question, I, I, personally, I mean, I, I don't see that a data model in itself or a data strategy in itself um, has a great uh, ROI. I, th I think where you measure the ROI is that if you have a data strategy, for example, that has as, as its core uh, a cost reduction strategy, uh, maybe putting stuff that you can out to the cloud, reducing operational costs, um, reducing costs of failure, for example, in processes by improving data, then the ROI tends to come from that. I mean, there are obviously some of the benefits I listed earlier of having a data strategy and having data models are there. I mean, you know, you can do things more efficiently. As Donna, Donna said earlier, if you have data models, you can design data warehouses much more quickly. And of course, the, the whole thing about reuse that I mentioned earlier as well has benefits. Whether you could put, you can't put a generic return on investment in what those benefits are because they will vary from organization to organization. But it's like everything else. If you don't have a plan and you don't have a strategy and you don't have models of what you're trying to do, then you can't possibly measure anything. But at least doing it this way, you have a chance of actually finding some real tangible benefits when you start to improve the data as a result of the strategies that you put in place. Great. I think that's a... Good All right. We are right at time. Or so, um, unfortunately, we we are out of time. But I'll, I'll get some of these questions over to you, Donna, um, and uh, if uh, if I may put you on the spot here a little bit, um, maybe we can get some a couple answers out into the follow up email. Uh, That's the answer, and then if folks want to also, we can email us directly if you have any questions. We're happy to follow up. Yeah. Love. Awesome. All right. Well, I, as mentioned, I will send a follow-up email within two business days, so by end of day Monday, with links to the slides, the recording of this presentation. And uh, again, thank you so much for kicking off this webinar series with us. Um, what a great way to to start. We really look forward to um, the future. Um, uh, webinars, and as Donna mentioned, make sure you get a, uh, let us know if there's additional topics you want to see us do next year. Um, uh, and if you have any thing targeted um, you want to have uh, addressed in the in the data modeling on big data next month, I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, everybody, and we will see you next month. Thank you. Thanks, bye.